Hi, welcome to Coach to Coach C to C. I'm Jane Mudgett. I am a coach, an author, and a presenter, and I am really excited today because uh, Gabriel Wilson is uh, a coach and a presenter and a facilitator, and he's joining us today from Salt Lake City, Utah, one of my favorite oh. ski towns, actually, my ski mountain. Uh, I met Gabe last year when he was presenting at Coaches Rising, a summit that they did last year for a couple of weeks that was really outstanding. And you were one of those contributors, Gabe, that uh, just really hit home. Uh, you and your uh, business partners were talking about your book, which is Compassionate Conversations. So I'll have a, a, a real picture of that later, but your book really hit home. Um, and I, I just wanna thank you for sharing that with the, with the world. Today, uh, we're not going to talk about compassionate conversations, except in the context of, of a whole different new idea called intergroup leadership. And we're going to back into that a little bit that Gabe and I have been talking about that, but this is an area where he is really passionate about. And it's a new way of thinking about how we lead the people with whom we work. So Gabe, why don't you just get started on sort of the basic premise of the us versus them dynamics? Totally, thank you, Jane. And just thank you for inviting me on and hosting and, and engaging this conversation. So um, yes, fundamentally intergroup leadership is about how to lead and facilitate these us and them dynamics. And just to really provide a simple definition for what intergroup leadership is, it's as simple as leadership that has the capability of bringing groups together. Okay. That's it. Um, so us and them dynamics, let me put it this way. I'll, I'll kind of take a global point of view and then I'll bring it down to the business context. Okay. From a global point of view, ethnocentric, tribalistic, us and them orientations riddle our collaborations, just geopolitically. And if you look at even just this past year, the concerns over Iran and, new, and the enrichment of nukes and whatnot, I presence that because ethnocentrism has always been with us and the conflict it engenders has always been with us. But when you add and when you add very powerful technologies into that cocktail, we become existentially threatening to ourselves, right? Just by the push of a button. Um, so that's happening. Also, to make the point, politically in the United States, we're very fractured. We're very polarized. And there's several things that are polarizing us the movement for racial justice happens to be an incredibly polarizing right. function in our culture. But also, interestingly enough, COVID is an incredibly polarizing function. You wouldn't think that just putting a mask on to help other people not get something would be just straightforward. But the actual act of putting a mask on has taken on a political stance or a communication. Oh, you put a mask on, you must be part of this party or whatever. So that's problematic. You also have a situation where close to 50% of the population doesn't believe in the election results, for example, right? And when you think of the attempts from foreign agents, governments or whatnot, influencing our elections, they're, they're taking advantage of the fact that internally we're against each other, right? So from a national security point of view, us and them dynamics within our borders is a problem that makes us in, insecure and susceptible to attacks, right? Yeah, so your point is not taking one side or another in any of these examples, but just saying that we've moved from someplace in the middle, if we think of our bell curve, to these outliers and that creates the polarization, tension and conflict. Okay, yeah. And vulnerability. And vulnerability, yeah. Right, so 
we need to be able to have a form of leadership that honors the differences, but also provides a unifying function, right? So let's bring it down to businesses. I see a vacuum and a need for leaders that have the capability of bringing groups together to accomplish the work that we need to accomplish, right? And the clients that I'm working with right now, they're dealing with your typical organizational intergroup dynamics where you have one functional team, functional team A, supposed to be working with functional team B, but they're actually competing against each other because they're competing for funding, resources. They're competing for the attention maybe of leadership because they want to advance their thing over their other team's thing. So just even that internal politicking that groups do with each other, that feels pretty natural, um, not out of the blue, but I support leaders in helping bring these teams together, right? And not compete with one another. The other thing that's happening, which I think is important to presence, is that the cultural streams that we're experiencing in our society. So again, the fight for racial justice, or it can be the pandemic, um, it could be politics, they're in our business spaces. So as a facilitator, I'm constantly advising, playing that advisory role, but also helping organizations as a whole have conversations, productive ones, about any of those topics, because it's literally so permeated the work culture that it's distracting and it's impeding the collaborations that need to happen in service of the work. Does that make sense? It does make sense because in some respects, you know, it reminds me of if you can't beat them, you know, join them. And what I mean by that, we can certainly say, stop paying so much attention to information overload, but that's not gonna happen. So because that's not gonna happen, we need to figure out how to lead within that stimuli, even if the stimuli is polarizing or in itself creates some toxicity and conflict. 100%. Yeah. And one of the things that you pointed out in leading up to our conversation today was, Gay, there's so much theory about intergroup leadership, which is totally an accurate point of view. And I think there's an absence of actually the practice of intergroup leadership. Like actually, how do we develop ourselves whether it's a coach, facilitator, leader of a company, how do we develop ourselves to be adept at working with the tensions that arise naturally? You're not gonna avoid it. That just naturally arise between groups. How can you use that energy, capture it to generatively move forward? In other words, from a certain point of view, the closest reference point that we have in the leadership literature is the ability to resolve conflict. Like how capable are you of that? That's like a subset. So my, my curiosity today to just enter conversation with you is actually to move slowly, but with an eye towards what are the skills? And there's numerous, and I'll, we're not gonna address all of them. Right, right. But let's just start to flesh out the picture of what are the fundamental skills or building blocks we need to start moving towards intergroup leadership? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how does that sound? I, I think that's great. And I want to add one bit to it in that I feel so strongly in this, in this idea, in this concept. Um, I also feel that we have to start with ourselves. So a part of this with leadership, we're, we're so often giving leaders information and they're asking and learning and maybe in a very positive direction, mm -hmm. but we have to feel we have to work on this individually so that we can lead from within rather than leading from without. Perfect. Because Beautiful. then it becomes natural behavior. So what do you think are those skills that we need to learn and, and eventually internalize? 100%. So there are three, I'll list them okay. and then we can double click and go deeper into each one. Okay. Double click is kind of like a, I don't know what that is, a millennial reference. I don't know. It could be. A lot of, it a lot of my- cool. it Makes you sound cool. You're cool. It makes me sound cool. Okay. A lot of my friends say that. So it's cut on, double click. So there are three. So one, I think we need to understand 
our ego. And I'll define what that means. But I think the first skill is an awareness skill. So it's actually bringing awareness to how our ego functions, particularly under threat. Two is this skill, and it's probably a meta skill called empathy. Mm. Right? And I think the concrete basic skill tied to that is listening. Mm. Listening typically is the first thing to go out the door in tension, particularly conflict between people or groups. It's the first thing that goes out. And it's the first thing that needs to be reestablished, right? So listening slash empathy. Third one is, I'll call it principles. But as you said, this is an inner work, inner yoga that we need to be doing. The third one is being really clear. What are the principles that you're standing for that you're going to use to regulate and influence the dynamics interpersonally? Mm. So it's ego, empathy, principles. Mm -hmm. So just put yourself in any situation where you have been confronted with a stressful moment or you've been faced with a lot of uncertainty. Hello, COVID, for mm -hmm. those that are in business, mm -hmm. right? Oh. oh my God, what yeah. are we, what's happening? Right. That moment um, is an important moment to pay attention to from an ego point of view. You probably got destabilized. You probably went into a reactive mode. And the reactive mode probably was more about asserting control over the situation than actually doing something with insight <laughs> about the situation. Or having control taken away. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so our egoic function, that anxiety, the flight or flight system, that reverberation, yeah, point to this brainstem here. Brainstem, I love fight, flight or freeze. I'm in there, I'm anxious, 100%. fearful, uh, I'm reacting. I call that your ego. Yeah, okay. And what it's doing, and the way that I want to invite people to think about it is that your ego is like a homeostatic function. So if you just take the snapshot, not I'm not pointing us to our cognition, but I'm pointing us to more of our felt and emotional sense right now. Prior to COVID, let's say pre-COVID, things were going smoothly, let's say. Your nervous system was relaxed. It's just another day at work. COVID hits and you're in a different reality and your nervous system is freaking out. And it's trying to get back to that calm, steady, secure, yeah. predictable state. Stasis. <laughs> right? That's the ego. It's a homeostatic function. When it comes out of homeostasis, out of this secure spot, it's going to work to get you back here at kind of any cost. Right? When we're working with intergroups, Right. So if you can kind of imagine a, a moment in your company or a moment with some clients, if it's in a company context, might be a moment in your culture. Right. right? Let's say Black Lives Matter has that conversation has entered the system. Right. And it's actually galvanizing attention and it's polarizing potentially your employees. That's another moment where your ego is going to seek some homeostasis and make this problem, quote unquote, go away so we can go back to equilibrium. Um, so that's where the intergroup connection comes into. This egoic, defensive, homeostatic function will come into play when there's a conflict amongst your groups, right? And we, and, don't, want to, we don't want to think that if my, my, home, my stasis is here, my grounding is here, we don't want to think that it needs to change to someplace else. All we know is we want to go back to the basic. Exactly. But when it comes to Black Lives Matter and racial justice, we need to shift the whole paradigm, which means it needs to change. But at that moment in time, we are not there. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And, and what I want to point out, awareness and developing awareness sounds woo-woo gay, but from a neuroscientific point of view, the simple act of drawing attention to your egoic impulses, your defensive mechanisms actually downregulates them. Right. While allowing you to be present to the thing that's antagonizing you. Right. To the conflict. Right. 
So yeah, and Daniel Goleman talks a lot about that in emotional intelligence. First step, self-awareness. Second step, self-regulation. Yeah. Good. Precisely. Yeah. Right, so that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So that's why this skill, it's a skill, it's a muscle that you can flex, uh, is important to flex because it actually sets up the conditions for you to actually act in a more conscious way versus a reactive way. So what I want to say is um, with respect to this awareness, the cognitive cue I want to invite people to remember is that when you're feeling defensive and you're feeling threatened and there's a race to the bottom of your brainstem, just cognitively try to remind yourself, oh, this is an opportunity to grow. If I stay in this discomfort, I might actually learn something and grow from it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, I this is right up my alley because you you can't grow from from stability and stasis. You just can't. You you have to you have to shake up the apple cart a little bit. That's the right. Challenge is that moment in between that you're alluding to, and that yeah. is that discomfort that I'm feeling, fight, flight, or freeze, and maybe my heartbeat is is accelerating a little bit. I can't get to my impulse control and really rational executive thinking without right. taking that moment that you alluded to, Gabe, and yeah. and just mm -hmm. sort of breathing and absorbing because you can't open that pathway to real thinking unless you slow down, which is another thing that you said in the in the listening and in empathy, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. So once we have that gap that we've created for ourselves to respond consciously so between stimulus and response there's a gap that gap is your freedom to choose consciously what you do instead of reacting and so the next step for me is the empathy step and we're distilling that at least in this moment in this conversation to listening so in moments of uncertainty whether it's a business decision that when you make maybe COVID happened what do we do, right? That's a moment of actually slowing down. Even though the moment feels urgent and pressing, the counterintuitive move typically in the leaders that I see being successful is to slow down and assess the situation and spend the majority of their time assessing and receiving points of view or seeking points of view that they actually have no idea or clue about. And receiving that information and then based on that new information they have more choices and they probably have better choices to choose from just because they slow down and empathize now i'm using empathy in a broad sense here which is the ability to fully understand someone or something mm -hmm. which requires you to let go potentially of your own biases and points of view and there, there are two things that i want to just put to you and then I'd love to hear what you have to say one is from an empathy point of view, let's say we're trying to empathize with the person and they're angry about something. My injunction to you would be, you haven't empathized enough with that person if you're not as pissed as they are. Mm -hmm. If you can conceptually understand, but then emotionally pick up like, oh man, I'm pissed. Mm -hmm. For sure, right? If you can get into that space, then you've done it enough. If you can't, keep going, keep going. Um, so I just wanted to say that, go ahead. Yeah, I, and that allows you to respond versus react because you've gotten to the point with an empathetic approach of listening that you want to react. Mm -hmm. But by absorbing that and taking a moment, you can actually respond, which is a whole different way of, of engaging with that person. Yes, yes. And, and part of empathy is really giving, it's, it's for your own comprehension, but there's something else that's happening that's more subtle, mm -hmm. which is you're giving the person you're listening to the experience of being heard. Now, for the business folk, typically, well, not typically, but sometimes there might be resistance like, oh, come on, you know, Jesus. Yeah. Um, what I want to impress upon you is check out this author and practitioner. His name is Christopher Voss. 
And he was the head FBI negotiator for many years. And he filtered out the transcripts of all of his hostage negotiations into a successful pile and into a, we failed. We, we, we failed. Yeah. And the successful pile, interestingly enough, 90% of the transcripts in the successful pile had a key word that the non-successful pile um, had, right? So the successful pile, there was a key word from the hostage taker, which was, that's it. So whenever Chris would reflect back, like, why are you doing this, man? So I'm doing this because of that. And this happened to me. And I was trying to get medicine for someone that I care about. And this was the only way. This was my last resort. And Chris Voss just empathized. Oh, man. Well, so what I hear you saying is this, you know. And their response was, that's it. You got me. The moment that happened, Chris knew that he had the connection. And therefore, because he had the relational connection, he had the influence. Mm-hmm over that person. So again, I, I don't want to overlook this very simple thing, which is empathy is not just for your comprehension, but it's also to give the person that you're listening to the experience of being understood, being felt like you really heard them. And that supports the relationship and influence that you have over each other. Yeah. Well, a minute ago, we were talking a little bit about dialogues with the Dalai Lama and different Mm -hmm. stories that we had read or seen or heard of. And there was one story that I read about where there was a group presenting some information and ideas about their faith to the Dalai Lama. And after the interaction later that night, this man said to his colleague and friend, that the Dalai Lama listens so strongly that he, as the giver of information, almost cried. He never had anyone listening to him with so much empathy that Mm -hmm. he didn't even know how to react. It was (laughs) such a gift. Now that's the extreme example, but I wanted to illustrate that as well. Yeah. But then there's that third skill that that you want to talk about that as well, this idea of values and principles. Yeah. So again, just a quick recap. Intergroup conflict will probably scare you. So you need to notice your egoic machinations that are going to try to resolve or relieve you of the tension. We don't want to move in that direction. We want to regulate that so you can be present to the conflict. Second move get really curious, empathize, get really curious about why that group is upset. Go deep into each member of that group and really try to understand why they're upset or why they're frustrated or why they're concerned and keep going until you feel the same concern and the same threat or the same whatever as they are. And then go to the other side, empathize again. What's your experience? It's all you're doing. Third move, um, third skill, is really the principles. What are you standing for that will, through your own modeling as a leader, influence the relationships and how they're playing out? For example, in my work as a facilitator, I'm brought in to help people through their conflicts all the time. And there's actually a group now that I'm working with where the conflict is between two groups, interestingly enough. Mm Um, theoretically, from the business point of view, they should be collaborating, but they're competing with each other. They have their own personal agendas. They, they're competing for the attention of the leader. They want more political power over another. There's all sorts of stuff. So I was brought in and I, and I said, I will work with you under one condition. And that condition is if the leaders of both of these groups can agree to being for each other. They literally need to be tethered to that over their personal interests. And then, so we brought those two leaders together. It's like, if you wanna work with me, this is, the, this is the principle that you need to attach yourself to. And what that will look like is when I notice in our facilitation, if I feel like you're not for each other at any moment, I'm just gonna name it and invite us to choose a different move so that I can feel the foreness. that's it. 
And they said, okay, so we, we've been working and I have not been shy mm -hmm. to say, hey, my experience right now was the criticism you provided had like a tearing down quality versus like an uplifting quality and binding us together in a shared common pursuit. So there's a moment I, just, I actually don't feel like you're for this other person. Is that the intention that you're trying to do right now? Is that the impact you're trying to have? It's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, that's not what I meant to do. Okay, so try something else because that was the effect on me. And I always turn to the group, is that how you felt it? And everyone's like, yeah, I felt like <laughs> yeah. shanked me, Yeah, you know? So that's the power of principles. So get very clear and it's gonna depend on you and your environment and what you wanna shape your culture into, but be very clear about the principle, explicate that principle to other people by inviting them into it and say, we'll be doing this conversation, but as we do it, I wanna pay attention to how we're doing it. And the principle helps us figure out how we wanna do this conversation. And it has a regulating function and also simultaneously helps us become who we want to become real time. Right. Mm -hmm. So th those are the, the three skills. I'm curious if you have any questions on the principle. Bit. Well, it made me, it made me think about how often, particularly in the Midwest that we avoid conflict and feel very uncomfortable about it. And I see in doing assessments that people have high harmony when it's, a, if it's strength finders, for example, that they, yeah. they want everybody to get along. And so I think when you create an environment, when you can call out one another and you're in your case, you're modeling it, mm -hmm. but you, if, if you walk away and they're still calling out one another in a comfortable way, all of a sudden that dialogue and that culture and that language changes over time. Yeah. And that does have an impact then on ego and it does have an impact on empathy. And then it does have an impact on the principle that finds strength within the group. So mm -hmm. it, it really feeds one another, Gabe. I, I like that a lot. And uh, um, it, it hit home for me. Let me just put it that way, it hit home. Yeah. Great. So let's, let's wrap up with an idea of where do we start with being aware of being a group member, being an intergroup leader when mm -hmm. it comes to these three skills? Where, where do we start? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that your presence being a group member. Ah. I would really... Yeah. yeah, as a group member, this is part yeah. of the awareness practice. No, yeah. it's good. This is part of the awareness practice. Typically, there's a lot of groupthink. To be part of a group, you need to agree on what the group thinks. And oftentimes, when I push into groups, there's actually a lot of diversity of thought mm -hmm. that gets pushed out in service of maintaining their group cohesion. Yeah. And I would say like, that's your ego trying to maintain homeostasis. Well, I'm not gonna share this perspective because it'll allow us to be in harmony, right? So just notice that, like start to notice the moments where you withhold a perspective in service of preserving group harmony. Mm -hmm. Notice that. Mm -hmm. Same thing for a leader. Oh, I don't wanna ruffle the feather. Just maybe it'll go away on its own accord. Maybe the problem or the tension will go away on its own accord. That's your ego. Mm -hmm trying to secure homeostasis and security, control, peace of mind right now, right? right? So that's where I would start. Just like draw your attention to the ways in which your ego is operating to preserve your sense of the status quo um, instead of allowing you to stay in the discomfort and then start to engage the empathy, start to think about the principles and therefore allow you to grow you like actually grow if you engage in empathy, you'll hear new perspectives, you'll receive new information. And then in terms of the principles, you'll actually grow your capacity to influence how the conversation could go. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple question of, I don't like how this conversation is going right now. It doesn't feel productive. Like you're in the tension, but it just feels like we're stuck in a rut. That's where the principle question comes in. Like what? 
is there another way that we could be having this conversation? Right. That would help us get out of this rut. That's the principle. So just ask yourself that question. Hmm. Is there a better way to have the conversation? Right. Yeah. And that goes back also to by being successful or I won't, I won't use that word by being moving forward with that thing, with that new way of thinking of having that awareness means we actually come back to what about the people rather than the product or service that still may be our end intent or the outcome that we're seeking. But when we have a better idea of, of individuals as well as the group dynamics, we're more likely to get to that end result. It may mean that we have to invest more time up front, but at some point momentum is built and speeds up not only innovation and creativity, but gets us to the, to the outcome. Uh -huh. It's a nonlinear process, which is what you and I talked about before, and people are not comfortable with a nonlinear process that isn't, that isn't step one, step two, step three, because it means you're doing a little pinball work before you get the momentum going. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and just to add to the last point, and then we're closing, is the slowing down, the leaders that I've seen slow down and engage in empathy and really try to hear from different people about their take on the problem that they're experiencing on the business side of the street. Could be around the assembly line, you know, could be whatever. Right. Typically, the ones that take the time end up getting a more comprehensive picture of the problem. And they actually realize, oh, what I thought was the root is not the root of the problem. And so they actually snip in the right place. Whereas the, the leaders that are motivated by maybe more reactivity, they're actually not noticing that they are being motivated by a desire to have a sense of control versus actual strategic impact. Um, they might snip at a place where it's actually, you just address the symptom. You didn't know it. You thought it was the root, but it was actually another symptom. Yeah. So it, it pays off dividends. And when you snip a symptom, you might, have, you might end up creating, you might fix that problem, but you might create another one because you didn't go deep enough. So just to your point. Yeah, we need a lot of tape, a lot of scissors, and a lot of fingers in the dike for that, right? I yeah. mean, because yeah. you're not rooting down deep to that foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gabriel Wilson, Gabe Wilson, uh, I'm delighted you joined me today. And I really have thought differently about intergroup leadership and thinking about my own ego and sense of empathy and principles in a new way, in a different way as a, as a motivator for me to slow down and identify so that I can learn to get out of the reaction zone into my respond zone and help the people around me as well. Because that, as you said, that will really create dividends. So thank you for joining me today, Gabe. Thank I you. enjoyed it very much. Um, I know our paths will cross again somehow, some way. So we will talk to you next time. And that's it for Coach to Coach.